ceremony or anything? No, you just jump in. Wait! Stop right there! I love you! Tom Hanks has only months to live, and then he falls in love with Meg Ryan. That's in Joe vs. the Volcano, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Joe vs. the Volcano, an offbeat fairy tale written and directed by John Patrick Shanley, best known for his script of Moonstruck. He's a fresh voice in the movies, but I don't think he paces this story well. It takes far too long to get to the good stuff. Tom Hanks plays an oppressed worker who finds out from his doctor he has only six months to live. That's why he's responsive to a wealthy man, Lloyd Bridges, who wants to send him on an all-expenses-paid vacation to an exotic island. All he has to do is jump in a volcano and appease the angry island gods. These are yours, if you take the job. It'll be uh, 20 days from today before you'd have to actually jump from the volcano. You could shop today. Meg Ryan plays three women in Joe's life. Here she's the materialistic daughter of Lloyd Bridges. But I think her character slows down the story. Daddy told me to tell you that I don't know what he hired you for and not to tell me that I'm totally untrustworthy. I'm a flibber to gibbet. Come on, let's get out of here. Joe is still on land for more than an hour into the movie when he meets another Meg Ryan character, a more upbeat daughter of Lloyd Bridges. She'll be going on the trip with him to the island. Where are you going? Can you believe it? Dad said not to tell you. Goes with my theory. Power makes you paranoid. When Joe finally makes it to the island, he encounters Abe Vigoda as the chief of the Waponi natives. Tonight we will have a big feast. And then at the end of the feast, you will climb to the top of the big room and you will jump in, okay? That's a cute way to play that scene. But only at the very end of the movie does Joe confront the volcano and the woman who loves him. You love me? Yes. I love you. I can feel my heart. I feel like I'm going crazy. You just can't die and leave me here on the stinking earth without you. I've got to do it. Why? Why? The chief doesn't even want you to do it. Do you, chief? Because I have wasted my entire life and I'm going to die. Now I have a chance to die like a man and I'm going to take it. I've got to take it. I love you. I love you too. I've never been in love with anybody before either. It's great. I am glad. <laughs> but the timing stinks. I gotta go. <laughs> there are wonderful moments in Joe versus the Volcano, and I want to recommend this movie for those special pieces of dialogue by John Patrick Shanley. But as I said before, I think he really draws out the premise of the story far too long, of Joe being miserable at work. That sequence goes on and on, and far too long with too many daughters. I think the script needs to be pared down, cleaned up, to let Tom Hanks interact with fewer but juicier characters. There's a wonderful chauffeur he meets, played by Ossie Davis. Mm -hmm. He could have uh, been uh, sort of like the character in Arthur, mm -hmm. the butler in Arthur, and have been his, sort of his guide for more of the movie. Uh, but we have so many characters, so it's a close call for me, but I have to give the film thumbs down. Well, first of all, I don't see what you mean that it takes too long to get to the payoff. The whole movie is just about the texture of the movie as it goes along. I mean, I didn't feel any impatience for him to get to that volcano, and indeed I thought the stuff on the island was the weakest stuff in the movie. I loved the production design that shows that ugly, squat, enormous factory building. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was designed by the same man who did uh, Beetlejuice. And what I like about the film is it's not shot in the same realistic humdrum world of every other movie. Both the dialogue and the look of the movie and the performances by Hanks and Ryan are on a fantasy level that's lots of fun. I just think he's like a beat, more than a beat late, a few minutes late. So I started doing a countdown. Let's get him going. Then when he gets to meet, he meets an interesting character. And the film starts rolling along, the Ossie Davis character. Then it comes to a halt when he meets the, the daughter. You know which one she I She was mean. cute, the middle daughter, the businessman, uh, the uh, business I, I, type person, yeah. I, I didn't Meg Ryan it. was good in all three roles. It was neat the way she showed the various versions of the ideal woman I only in Joe's liked, life. I only liked the last one. Well, uh, John Patrick Shanley, this is a very uneven career. He writes Moonstruck, which wins the Academy Award. Right. Then he writes 
The January Man, which is one of the worst movies of all time. Now he's back with this, and it's his first movie as a director. And I really liked the way that he goes for this kind of moonstruck sort of feeling in all of his movies. I where think, people, hey. had, you know, if you believe in magic, if you, not to coin a phrase, yeah. if you... Uh, if you have faith in yourself, if you believe that strange things can happen, they will. And that's the note in this movie that's so uh, much fun. That is the note that I like in the film. And I think this guy is a great asset in the film industry. I just don't think he's paced his story very well. And the end of the picture is sweet, and, and the drive of the film is nice. And I, and, and I don't like having to give it a negative vote, but I do because I think so I was So many of the movies we see are just made up out of it's, the bits and pieces. It's better than all of those movies. movies. It's better than this those movies. This is an movies. original movie with an original vision. Okay, next movie. Badly our next movie is an austere, austere and ambitious political fantasy named The Handmaid's Tale about a time in the near future when pollution has caused most of the citizens of Earth to become sterile. A few women remain fertile, and they are guarded as treasures by a police state that needs them in order to propagate itself. Nastasha Richardson and Elizabeth McGovern star in the movie as two renegades who have been rounded up for a trip to a holding camp for the fertile. What did you do? Nothing at you. You tried to cross the border. to the colonies if your ovaries are still jumping. Before long, Richardson is assigned to the home of a local party official played by Robert Duvall. The theory is that she will have his child. What it is, I thought it might be nice if we met under less artificial conditions. I thought I'd like to get to know you a little. Get to know me? Yes. Duvall's wife is played wonderfully by Faye Dunaway, who takes a personal interest in the duties of this surrogate mother. I want to ask you one question. Answer from your heart. Do you want a baby? Do you really want one? It won't work if you don't want one. Do you really want to have a baby? Yes, I do. We could help each other. The Handmaid's Tale is a curious film, controversial and yet cold, angry and yet never sure exactly what it's angry about. And it never really convinced me I was looking at a future society. I simply felt I was looking at a story about the future shot on location in the present. The movie was made by a lot of high-powered talent. It was directed by Volker Schlondorf, who directed the 1979 Oscar-winning film The Tin Drum. And the screenplay is by Harold Pinter, based on the novel by Margaret Atwood. The cast is strong, but a fable like this works only if it connects at some level with the feelings of its audience. And for me, this movie was all ideas and no emotion. And since it's about the way the state imposes its ideas on the emotions of its citizens, that was a fatal inadequacy. Uh, I agree with you uh, that the film for me works as a piece of almost set design and costume design. You get the points rather quickly and you see how it's typical with futuristic films. They're really comments on today, obviously, and they're showing us that the, today is pretty horrific if we look around and these are the roles that women are caught up in. At the same point, I didn't feel danger. I think of a picture like uh, Clockwork Orange, which mm -hmm. is showing a, a similar kind of future. Mm -hmm. And there, you really, really feel on edge and feel a threat. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, I, I just felt like once removed. I don't think it's because I'm a man and the film is women-centered. I mean, I, I, I just think that it isn't ang dangerous enough the in some way. The problem that all fables come up against is the fact that since the characters have to stand for something, can you also make them stand for themselves? Can you yeah, make them particular people as well as making them symbols? And in this movie, yeah. that really doesn't happen. Uh, at all. Uh, so that the only people who are really interesting in the film are the characters like Faye Dunaway plays, who, who does have a three-dimensional reality of her own, but the main characters in the movie just stand for things. They don't really involve us. Very cool. Coming up next, Rob Lowe plays the devil on James Spader's shoulder in Bad Influence. You and I need to talk. No. You're gonna die with your mouth shut. Our next film is called Bad Influence, and it stars the splendid actor James Spader from Sex, Lies, and Videotape as another timid soul who this time is taken for a walk on the wild side when he meets a violent, roguish character played by Rob Lowe in a bar. Spader is having a tough time at work from a colleague trying to get the same promotion that he is. Lowe plays the kind of character who would break the guy's legs immediately, but he sees that Spader is just a milk toast. What's his name? Patterson. Patterson. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. No. Come on. Patterson. Patterson. What kind of man are you that you drink to your enemies? 
This isn't funny. There. Show Patterson that face. To get ahead at work, Lowe suggests that Spader ignore his financial company's conservative trading regulations. So you can make them money. It's not illegal. What's the problem? It's more complicated than that. It's a question of judicious business. It's not a question of judicious business. It's a question of bonds. <clears throat> Naturally, things turn ugly, especially when Spader's competitive co-worker gets mugged on the same night Spader has gone out drinking and thieving with Rob Lowe. Did we go to Patterson's last night? Yes. We went to Patterson's. I mean, I didn't hit him, did I? He didn't just hit him. What the hell were you doing? Holding him down. And now all the violence is between the two of them. All the plot twists and turns in Bad Influence are predictable. What is not predictable is how ugly this film gets in terms of violence with beatings and stick-ups. There is a really trashy value system operating in this film as it, the film sort of romances the very style it seems to deplore. The performers are okay. I'm just surprised that James Spader agreed to work in such a morally bankrupt and implausible story. He was, oh. he was very good in Less Than Zero, which was a film that, that I don't think worked all that well, but at least it was honest about its uh, drug problem. Gene, this movie is about behavior. It is about a weak man who is attracted to a strong man who is a very dangerous, violent, and evil man. I could figure that out. It's the out. same story. The, the, the screenplay is written by a man named James Capp, who wrote a movie last year that I didn't like at all called Apartment Zero, but it's the same story. The weak man who has the strong man come into his life, and he really admires everything about him, except what he doesn't realize is the guy is some kind of a sociopath. Now, I that, think he that's what yeah. this movie is about. It's right. about how the guy... I, I knew that. What's the point? Well, well, I don't understand what you mean by bad values. James Spader doesn't have bad values in this movie. I would think that there was certain behavior here. I'm talking about the value system of the movie, which I think, rather than being a cautionary tale or, or some um, tough stance on the Rob Lowe character, really is, in its own way, embracing the, his actions. It's action. not at all. This is oh. a movie, this basically is a male version of Looking for Mr. Goodbar, in which he finds somebody who's going to turn his life around, and for a while he goes but along I, with that, and he finds out that through his own terrible drinking and drug problem, uh, he is led by this other guy down the garden path to doing all kinds of things that he wouldn't have ordinarily done by himself. It's about that. It doesn't endorse it. It doesn't <laughs> cheer uh, it know, on. Do you it's know, just, it's oh, the subject think, matter of the film. I'm just saying that the way it's told, and what upset me was, that it seemed to be saying on one thing uh, that guy shouldn't be doing what well, Lowe is saying, but at the same time, the film really loves what Lowe is doing. Didn't you find this as an interesting character story? Oh, absolutely not. The relationship between these two guys. Not in the slightest. Not at all? Not in the slightest way. And, and the reason is, I think that Spader has a real intelligence on the camera, uh -huh. and that he would see where Lowe was taking the him. The character that he plays doesn't see until it's too late. That's what the movie is about. And I'm saying it isn't convincingly told because Lowe, mm. beca because Lowe is so obviously a slime bucket that you can tell the characters. We that... disagree. Actually, oh, yeah. he couldn't tell that soon anyway because he's completely drunk every night. I think the most amazing tell... thing in the movie is how he's able to get to work at 5.30 in the morning in that condition. Now, that's... That's a big for, change. That's a big change in real his mystery. life. Okay, when we come back, Coupe de Ville, about three brothers who drive a Cadillac from Detroit to Miami and try to find themselves along the way. Mo, Larry, and Curly. The three Jabonis. DeVille, and this is another one of those movies where the characters get in a classic old car and drive across America trying to find themselves in the process. The movie's heroes are three brothers who have fought since they were children, and now, somewhere between Detroit and Miami, they're fighting again. I got you way down low. Those are the words. It's a hump song. It's a hump song. When you hump, not humping. Oh, get off. Daniel Stern is the older brother there. Eric oh Gross is the middle God. brother, and Patrick Dempsey is the youngest. During a refueling stop, they call ahead of their father, played by Alan Arkin. Mom? Ma's fine. Everybody's fine. Tell me about the car. Oh, it's beautiful, Pop. It's just perfect. Marvin, make sure it stays that way. The deal is they have to deliver the car without a scratch on it. So, of course, they can't, and they don't. Oh, 
Well, I enjoyed hearing Louie Louie and Transfusion again, I guess, but I didn't enjoy Coupe de Ville very much. The characters are so shallow that they define themselves only by how loud they shout during their arguments. The bonding process takes place only when Stern beats up a guy who has beaten up his younger brother. The colorful characters they meet along the way have all been recycled out of Little Abner. The car gets damaged with complete predictability, and then it gets repaired with complete unbelievability. And then the ending is schmaltzy and embarrassing because it belatedly tries to attach some significance to this cornball plot. I suffered through this movie. It didn't have a single shot worth looking at or a single surprise except for that one character of the car repairman. And played by James Gammon. He comes in late in the picture. He's marvelous. Everything he says is funny, and the way he says it is funny, and that's a little jewel in a bad film. Uh, and I really enjoy cross-country movies. I, I, I always like them. I like looking at the landscape, if nothing else. And here, it was really uh, distracting for me because there was so much shouting. Uh, the, the director, Joe Roth, here, I think makes a mistake. He should have sort of told the guys to tone it down sometimes. Uh, Daniel Stern, in particular, uh, the one with the crew cut, uh, the older brother, is yelling at the top of his lungs throughout most of this picture, and it really hurts. I mean, the picture isn't warrant that kind of anger. I mean, it's, it's not Marlon Brando, who's uh, why you know, committed when suicide. You, I when mean, you talk about a cross-country movie, one of the pleasures of a cross-country movie, and of course, the, for example, Rain Man last year, which won the right. Oscar, is to see the country unfolding. Yes. Now, the problem here is they begin in, in Michigan. Right. They're going to Florida. They spend about 10 minutes in Michigan, and then they spend the rest of the movie mostly on bridges going over the water in Florida. I mean, yeah. it looks like... There was like some shooting in South Carolina, too. Just a very little of it, though. I mean, yeah. I don't know that much about, necessarily, about the geography of our interstate highway system, but it seemed to me like they spent hours and hours and hours over the water on mm. bridges that looked like they were going down to Key West or someplace and uh, very little time in the rest of the country, nor did they meet people from the rest yeah, of the country. They didn't meet interesting people, and they themselves didn't have a whole lot to talk about other than just plain yelling. Coming up next, Love at Large, a fanciful romantic detective story with Tom Berenger on the trail of a bigamist. I want you to continue to follow him. Are you sure you want this guy in your life? Our next film is called Love at Large, written and directed by Alan Rudolph, who typically makes moody films that owe a lot to old-fashioned Hollywood films of the 40s. Here he gives us a hard-boiled detective story with Tom Berenger as Detective Harry Dobbs, hired by Ann Archer to spy on a man. Both actors really overplay their accents here. I need you to follow a man. He can't know that you're doing it. Don't worry, he'll never know. I'll pay you $2,000 plus expenses to follow Rick for one month. His initial investigation turns up the fact that the man named Rick is happily married. Right. Meanwhile, another private detective, a woman, is trailing Berenger. Did you get a good look at him? Good enough. And her. The film turns into a love isn't easy battle between the two investigators, Berenger and Elizabeth Perkins. Out, you know. I'm not going to be very happy if you're working for McGraw or King. Is that a threat? Let's just say I'm very good at what I do. Fooled me. What's that supposed to mean? You get too close to your subjects, Mr. Dobbs. Love at Large is not successful in mixing its wildly different styles. At times, it's a 40s parody. I don't think that works very well at all. Other times, it's a contemporary story, and a lot of those scenes do work. The investigation of this guy, Rick, is the most interesting element of the film, but that investigation is constantly being interrupted by visits between Berenger and Ann Archer, whose line readings are just too wacky for my taste. And the relationship between Berenger and Perkins suffers too. Some straight line writing, I think, would help here a lot. The movie is, I think, very confused in terms of what it wants to do. Alan Rudolph is very good at creating slightly off-center universes, yeah. as he did in Trouble in Mind and in Choose Me. Mm. It seems to take place in the, in the current world, but the current world it filled it through a lot of movie sensibility. a different time track. Yeah. Now, the problem here is he's trying to do a satire of a genre in his own style. Now, you have to do a satire of a genre in the style of that genre, basically. And the problem is, what he's really doing, he's satirizing detective movies that have never been made, except by him, in his mind, in his style. Yeah, well, I mean, but I can get even more specific, which, uh -huh. which is that I mean, when you hear Ann Archer talking that way, and when you hear Berenger talking that way, I mean, you just you say, that's just not right. I mean, it's, it's, they took a risk, but they, they blow it. I mean, it, it doesn't work. He is one of the most interesting directors around right now, but this is not one of his most interesting movies. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. A split vote on Joe versus the Volcano. Gene liked parts of the film, 
I really enjoyed writer-director John Patrick Shanley's Moonstruck Whimsy. Two thumbs down, though, for The Handmaid's Tale, a futuristic feminist fable that didn't really engage our emotions. A split decision on Curtis Hansen's bad influence with Rob Lowe leading James Spader down a dangerous trail. I thought it was about immorality. Gene thought it embraced immorality. The writer's name, by the way, is David Cap. I had it wrong earlier. Two thumbs down for Coupe de Ville, the inane and predictable self-discovery road movie. And two more thumbs down for Alan Rudolph's Love at Large, a parody in search of a genre. And the one I like the best, mm -hmm. I think, was probably Joe versus the Volcano. And the, one, and the one that I like the best is Joe versus the Volcano of, of the ones that we're talking about here. It is the best of that group. I wish there are sweet, wonderful things in the picture. It's just that it's wildly Well, uneven. it would be if he could have pulled off the ending. See, that's why I'm surprised that you were impatient to get to the ending, because I was disappointed when we got there. Okay, well, that's it for this week. Next time, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Blue Steel, a thriller starring Jamie Lee Curtis as a street cop chasing a serial killer. Also, Nuns on the Run, a comedy starring Monty Python's Eric Idle. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Super 8 motels with over 700 locations nationwide and the American Express card welcomed at all of them. Don't leave. You can win a submarine in the Nestle Crunch Hunt for Red October sweepstakes and watch for the major motion picture starring Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin. Ruffy's Color Sense Waste Bags with decor coordinated pastel colors and fresh fragrances. The decorator bag for kitchen, bath, and bedroom. Redkin Classics, hair care products formulated to create beautiful, healthy hair. So effective, their formulas transcend time. Available exclusively at salons.